prioritize their personal agenda above the agenda of the American people. At America First Works, we envision an America where power doesn't live in the marble hallways of a distant uh, institution, but lives in the hands of the American people, the people who build our cities, the people who till our lands, the people who fight for us every single day, for the people who dream of a better future for their children. And by having the conversations like the ones we're having today, we will advance an America First agenda for the American people, not the political elite, not the unelected bureaucrats. Today, I have the honor of introducing a distinguished leader in the America First movement, Brooke Rollins. Brooke embodies the spirit of our founding fathers. She's from a small town of Glen Rose, Texas. You could say she left her farm to serve in the former administration as the director of the White House Domestic Policy Council and chief strategist. After her service, she founded America First Policy Institute, where she serves as president and CEO as well as the Senior Advisor for America First Works, the sister organization. Today, she will lead our conversation on the bureaucracy that we are experiencing today. And without any further delay, I'd like to, to introduce Brooke Rollins. Well, hello everyone and welcome to the headquarters of America First Policy Institute and our sister organization, the sponsoring uh, organization for today, America First Works. We're so glad to have you and what an honor it is for the last two plus years to uh, have served as first the founder but now the president and CEO of uh, America First Policy Institute and as a senior advisor of America First Works. Uh, as Ashley mentioned before, AFPI and AFW, I uh, was so honored to be part of the last administration, uh, first running the Office of American Innovation and then eventually as Domestic Policy Chief in the last White House. When AFPI launched just over two years ago, uh, you all may not be surprised to remember that it was far from the most auspicious time for that endeavor. The Biden administration had just begun and leftists and progressives dominated federal governance and nothing perhaps was more unlikely, maybe even unliked at that moment than the phrase America first. So in the face of all that, in that environment, we launched America First Policy Institute and America First Works to do no small thing. And that thing was to save this country and to save the country we love. It is a simple thing, but it is also the hardest thing. Simple and easy are not the same, but we didn't get into this business. And on behalf of the 170 team members here at AFPI and AFW, uh, we're so grateful to be in this battle with so many of you. Everything that moved our creation back then, just over two years ago, remains true today, but perhaps even more so. The need for what we deliver animates our mission and our purpose. As the home of the America First movement, we do what the arbiters of opinion and policy almost never do. We listen to Americans. That's how we know, contrary to the current administration and media narrative, that America First has never been more popular, more needed, and more urgent than today. Speaking of listening to Americans, what a joy it is to be with you today, and we believe over 100,000 viewers online for this, our very first America First Works speaker series. This series will serve as a neutral and nonpartisan platform for elected representatives, visionary business trailblazers, intellectual pioneers, and dynamic policy champions to discuss and present important public policy matters. Though we may not all share these same views, I am willing to bet that the majority of Americans mostly share the same understandings. We believe in the real sovereignty of the nation, and we believe that America is fundamentally good and that it is a positive virtue to put America first. In 2023, today, we must confront the alarming threat to the State of the Union, the out-of-control administrative state. However, its challenges have provided us with an important and timely opportunity, the basis of our keynotes comments today, a national high stakes 
conversation on the sort of republic, the type of country, and the way of life that we as Americans want to have and want to give to our children and to our children's children. It's the reason we are gathered here today. The administrative state was born over a century ago in the minds of post-Civil War progressives who believed that the Constitution of the United States at that moment was inadequate for what they deemed as a modern society. Since then, it, the administrative state, has advanced in great leaps periodically from the New Deal to the Great Society to the agenda of the Obama and Biden administrations. The deconstruction of the administrative state is a moral and constitutional act to reclaim the governance of our republic from the forces that have progressively seized it from us across the past century. It is the administrative state that enacts the will of the progressive left, that thwarts the will of the American people, and that makes the winning of elections not the end of our fight, but the mere beginning. Because as soon as the act of persuasion of the general public is over, what remains is trench warfare against a group of people in the bureaucracy who see themselves as permanent and for too long have been just that. The administrative state is where the education, the inspiration, and the fanaticism of the left go to reside, and that is why they will go to defend it in ways they will not do so with their other areas and centers of power. The Trump administration that, again, I was so proud to be a part of was perhaps the most consequential in its reclamation of our Supreme Court and huge swaths of our historic number of appointments, as well as the effort to eliminate what began as two new regulations, two old regulations for one new, ended at about 11 old regulations that went out for every one new and amongst other projects. But what remains to be done is the full reclamation of the administrative state. The millions of bureaucrats who work mostly unknown and out of the public eye to exercise governance not in the name of the American people, but in the interests of what they believe that they represent. Without that accumulated power and unearned potency over the American people, there is no power. That's why, to me, this battle and this conversation today is truly the singular greatest battle that we face as a country. But here's the good news. It's a fight we can win because the more people know about it, the more it is part of the national narrative, the more it becomes part of an important conversation that has already begun but will continue through 2024, the more average everyday Americans understand what's at stake. Americans don't wish and never have wished to be ruled. They wish to rule themselves. At AFPI and America First Works, we believe that this moment and how we respond to it will determine the future of our country. As we speak, our AFPI team with nine former cabinet officials, 20 former White House senior staff, and more than 50 senior administration officials in partnership with more than 400 former senior federal government leaders has formed 28 action plan teams preparing for the next administration and the next White House. Today, we are joined in continuing this conversation by someone who has done a lot of thinking on this issue and many issues, uh, to be honest, but he is our longtime friend, and much more importantly, he is Liberty's longtime friend. When our three-month-old organization decided to take on big tech back in 2021, uh, our lawsuit against Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube for censoring millions of Americans Vivek provided much of that legal strategy and advice. He, along the way, has been a dear friend to this organization, to our ideas, and an advisor along the way, and for that, I am forever grateful. We all know that he graduated summa cum laude from Harvard, receiving his JD from Yale Law School, then starting a biotech company, uh, Royavant Sciences, where he oversaw the development of five drugs that went on to become FDA approved. In 2022, and I remember the initial 
initial conversation with him about Strive, an asset management firm that directly competes with asset managers that may not be aligned with our ideas like BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, and others, where he and his company would use the money of everyday citizens to advance agendas that they didn't necessarily agree with from the prior companies. We should pause here, though, and note that the most impressive thing about our friend Vivek, it's not his degrees from very fancy universities or his founding of billion-dollar businesses, although that's all very impressive. And many in his point in life would choose a different path, a path of a lot of leisure and fun and getting to uh, rest on what he has already built at such a young age. But instead, Vivek has chosen to run directly into the arena to save the country that he so loves. Please help me welcome one of the great friends of AFPI, of Liberty, and of this conservative movement, Vivek Ramaswamy. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I want to recognize the team at AFPI for putting this on. I chose to be here for a reason, for delivering the speech that we're about to today. I think this will be quite possibly the most consequential speech about exactly how we will get this job done of shutting down the administrative state. But the reason I wanted to do it and wanted to recognize many of the people in the audience today is that you have been at the bleeding edge of this fight. This is not an individual sport. This is a team sport. There will be no political messiah coming from the White House on high to save us. If we are going to be saved, it is going to be because we save ourselves. And I think that that is the mentality that I respect most about this institute. And Brooke, I'd like to recognize Brooke Rollins for her outstanding leadership. Let's give her a round of applause as well for leading this great institute. So thank you, Brooke. I appreciate that. I want to kick this off by actually a reflection on national unity. We are deeply divided as a country today. And I think the way that some in both political parties imagine we might get to national unity is through compromise. It would seem to be the obvious approach, actually, if you have people who are badly divided. Perhaps the way you get to uniting that country is through compromise. I actually reject that vision. I believe that the way we will unite this country is by being uncompromising about the principles that set the country into motion in the first place. I think we have to be honest with ourselves that America was not founded on moderate ideals. America was founded on radical ideals. That idea that you get to speak your mind, and you do, and you do, and you do too, as long as I get to in return. That is a wild idea for most of human history. It was done the other way. The idea that we're a nation not of men, but a nation of laws, founded on the rule of law. That we pursue excellence without apology. That you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. These are extreme ideals. And the way we will reunite this country is not by hiding from the radicalism of the American Revolution, but by embracing it. That is our true strength, our diversity and our differences. That's not our strength. Our strength is what unites us across that diversity. That's actually the subject of the speech today. One of those, perhaps the most foundational of those radical ideals. A radical dream that our founding fathers had 250 years ago. A radical dream that I have that many of us in this room share today as citizens in 2023. That the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government. Not the managerial bureaucracy in three-letter government agencies, not elite leaders in the back of palace halls in old world England. Not enlightened elites in the back of BlackRock's corner office in Park Avenue of Manhattan today. Not monarchs sitting in three-letter government agency buildings here in Washington, D.C. 
That's what we're here to talk about. This is part of the project of reviving, but yes, also reuniting our country. And I will say at the outset, this is not a black idea or a white idea. This is not even a Republican idea or a Democratic idea. This is a fundamentally American vision that we fought a revolution to secure in 1776, that we the people create a government that is accountable to us, not the other way around. What's happened in the last century, and it did begin with Woodrow Wilson, the godfather of the modern administrative state, perpetuated by FDR, further exacerbated then by presidents and leaders of both political parties, is that we saw a gradual waterfall of political responsibility in this country. Moving away from Congress and the Senate and the U.S. presidency towards three-letter government agencies that wield the most political power in the federal government despite having the least political accountability through unelected bureaucrats who have no backstop of actually being accountable to the public. I often think about the standard we should measure how well we're doing as a country is how Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, John Adams, how would they feel if they were walking around Washington, D.C. today? And these are men, by the way, who deeply disagreed with a lot of a lot of questions relating to the founding of our republic, but they agreed on one thing, that at the very least, the lawmakers and policymakers we elected should actually be the ones making public policy in this country. So against that backdrop, today I'm here to announce how we will revive the promise of that constitutional republic with three branches of government rather than four. That is the purpose of our meeting today. And we're going to get into a level of detail that is, to this point in the last half century, unprecedented, which I believe will spawn nothing short of not incremental reform, but a revolution, a revival of the ideals of the American Revolution in how we actually restore that constitutional republic. First, it will be a plan that reduces the size of the federal employee headcount by over 75% if I'm the next president by the end of my first term, 50% of which is implementable by the end of year one. Second, rescinding a majority, that is to say over 50% of federal regulations which fail the major questions doctrine at issue in West Virginia versus EPA, likely the most important Supreme Court case of our lifetime decided last year. And third, the president's power to use executive authority to shut down redundant federal agencies and to reorganize the federal government accordingly. That's what we're going to talk about today. Thank you. Now, before I get into those, the details of the first five agencies we will shut down and the basis for rescinding a broad swath of federal regulations, it's first and most importantly worth understanding why it hasn't happened yet. This vision is not an original vision. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit that. Good presidents, excellent presidents, from Reagan to Trump, have spoken to the same ideal. And I give credit to Donald Trump for taking more steps than have been taken in a generation in the direction with the Schedule F exceptions that they began late in the term, aided by many people in this room. That was a step forward. But in order to actually get this job done, we're going to have to confront several myths that have been perpetuated in this town by advisors and members of the very bureaucracy we're looking to shut down that we're going to have to confront and overcome to understand how the U.S. president can actually get this job done. We're going to go through those today. It's our first time doing a speech like this with visuals, so you'll have to uh, be patient and see how this one goes. But I think it's important to understand the specifics. The first myth is that the President of the United States does not single-handedly have the ability to set what you would call the human resources policies, the hiring and firing policies in the federal government. That view is wrong. The truth of the matter is that the U.S. president actually enjoys broad statutory authority 
to prescribe the rules of the civil service. If you want the citation, turns out the president, and I'm going to read from the U.S. Code, may prescribe such regulations for the admission of individuals into the civil service of the executive branch that will best promote the efficiency of that service. That's 5 U.S.C. 3301. Now, most federal employees work in what's called the competitive service. Well, it turns out the rules governing the competitive service for the U.S. president are even broader, pursuant to 5 U.S.C. 3302, that says the U.S. president has similar power to, I quote the law, prescribe rules governing the competitive service, which includes most federal bureaucrats. What does that mean? It's like the equivalent of working at a company. The HR department does not actually determine the rules without reporting into the CEO. It works the same way for the U.S. federal government as well. Well, that leads to a second myth that's perpetuated itself in this discussion of how we take on the administrative state. So, so far we've established that the U.S. president has, pursuant to 5 U.S.C. 3302, sole authority to set the regulations, the rules, governing the Office of Personnel Management, governing the, pers com the competitive service. Well, the myth number two that's been taken for granted in our national history is that the President of the United States is limited in his ability to fire those employees pursuant to a part of the U.S. Code known as 5 U.S.C. 3513A, which creates so-called four-cause limitations, which say that the U.S. President cannot fire a bureaucrat unless it is what you call four-cause, breaking the law, doing something egregious. That's been the status quo in Washington, D.C. Turns out that is actually a myth. <laughs> Turns out large-scale reductions in force are not covered by the statute. They're covered by a different statute, 5 U.S.C. 3502, that says that reductions in force are subject only to 60-day notice requirements and further what you call order of retention rules, the order in which you fire those employees. Think about it. The logic makes sense. If there's an individual federal employee who may disagree with the next U.S. president, who may have different views than I do on abortion or on gun control but works in the EPA, these rules are designed to protect those employees from individual politicized retribution. Like it or not, that is what the civil service rules say. But they do not apply to reductions in force, large-scale mass layoffs. And large-scale mass layoffs are absolutely what we will bring to the D.C. bureaucracy, both because it is necessary and it is sanctioned by the law of the United States of America. Now, I believe in getting into detail. This is an occasion to dive deeper into that detail. Under the current rules, the rules governing how those employees are fired in large mass-scale layoffs are governed by the Office of Personnel Management and the OPM rules. The current OPM rules give that responsibility to agency heads. That is a fact. Well, I think that raises the importance of making sure the next U.S. president appoints agency heads in those roles who are prepared. I think it should be a litmus test for anybody who serves in a cabinet-level position, a litmus test that that agency head is prepared to carry out mass layoff, large reductions in force as laid out in the statute. However, if such agency head is even as unprepared to act after on the job, recall the first point that I mentioned. The U.S. president has sole authority to set the rules governing the Office of Personnel Management, which does absolutely give the duly elected president of the United States the power to single-handedly execute those large-scale layoffs and mass reductions in force. This completely subverts the traditional wisdom fed to U.S. presidents from Reagan to Trump over the last 40 years, but will be a necessary toolkit that says that the CEO, the leader of the executive branch, does indeed have the authority to decide who is and is not hired in the executive branch. And I'll tell you this, speaking as a CEO, if somebody works for you and you can't fire them, that means they don't work for you. 
it means you work for them because you're responsible for what they do without any authority to actually change it. But the beauty of this is that our law tracks this directly if we're willing to actually read the law in totality. So now, because this is important, we're going to get a lot of pushback to this speech, I have no doubt about it. I want to go to actually a common misconception that comes up for how this is able to occur in practice. The next myth is that if you're carrying out these mass layoffs, you still have to do it within the structure of the existing agencies as they continue to exist. That's actually false. The myth is that the U.S. president does not have power to unilaterally reorganize or shut down federal agencies. Well, it turns out. The truth of the matter is, the key provisions of the 1977 Reorganization Act are actually still in effect. I'm going to read to you from the 1977 Act, 5 U.S.C. 901, active law today. And who ever thought it's worth paying attention to the words of the law itself? The president shall. There are statutes that say the president may. This isn't one of them. The president shall, from time to time, examine the organization of all agencies and determine what changes in such organization are necessary to carry out any policy set forth in this statute. What are the policies set forth in that statute? I've picked two examples for our purposes today. Number one, to reduce expenditures and promote economy to the fullest extent consistent with the efficient operation of government. Number two, to reduce the number of agencies by consolidating those having similar functions under a single head and to abolish, that's not my word, that is a word in the statute, to abolish such agencies or functions thereof as may not be necessary for the efficient conduct of the government. This is not a suggestion to the U.S. President from Congress. This is a mandate to the U.S. President from Congress to exercise the authority to reorganize and shut down statutes, words, abolish such agencies if it promotes the economy, or in the alternative, if it eliminates redundant federal agencies. This completely debunks the traditional mythology that actually the way the U.S. President actually has to act is by going to Congress. Now, part of the reason why, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you here, is after I remove that second truth, what you're going to see is a myth that says there's a Supreme Court case called INS versus Chada that actually in 1984 dealt with a correction to the 1977 Act. And this is arcane stuff, but this is actually important to get to the bottom of what's going on. What Congress said in 1977 is there could be a single house veto of a presidential reorganization path. What the Supreme Court held to be unconstitutional in that case was actually the single house veto. So they said, no, 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 you can't do it with a single house veto. It has to go through both chambers of Congress. That's what INS versus Chada said, but it's been misinterpreted and fed incorrectly to people who have occupied the position that I'm running to occupy to say that that stops the U.S. president from acting unilaterally. The truth of the matter is the U those provisions that required the U.S. president to seek congressional consent, those provisions had deadlines. But the unexpired provisions that are still good on the books are the ones that actually require, mandate the U.S. president to examine the efficient functioning of government from time to time. So now we're going to get into the specifics of how this actually works. Okay, what agencies are we actually going to shut down and how? I mean, the final real myth here that I think we got to pay attention to is this idea that the administrative state, as we know it, is somehow an impartial scientific management project that is able 
to take on what we the people can't be trusted with. This is what's actually at stake here. It is a skepticism of we the people and our ability to settle our differences on questions from climate change to racial injustice. See, the old world view was that the people can't be trusted. The people can't be trusted to sort out how to address existential climate change. If we leave it to the people, our planet's going to burn its way to pieces. We're going to have systemically inequitable results amongst different races. This is what's baked in. It is that old world monster rearing its head again that is fundamentally skeptical of a self-governing people. But what we actually have in this country is a constitution that in Article 2 of the Constitution clearly states that the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. And the person whom we elect to run that executive branch, the U.S. president, must actually once again be the person who actually runs that executive branch of government. That is the final myth that once we debunk it, we have democratic accountability once again, rather than puppets sitting in the White House, as I worry we have today, uh, instruments of an administrative state. So the question is, how do we then, on the back of having debunked these myths, how do we actually proceed step by step to taking on and dismantling that administrative state? Well, it is the source of regulations, and we'll get to that in a second. But what about the regulations that are already on the books? This is where West Virginia versus EPA comes in. So this is likely the most important Supreme Court case of our lifetime when it comes to the ability to restore our constitutional republic. What the Supreme Court held here is that there are certain major policy questions this is called the major questions doctrine, that have to be decided by publicly elected representatives, those who serve in Congress and those who serve in the U.S. Senate. These questions cannot be delegated without express congressional authority to third-party administrative agencies. So here there was a clean power plan perpetuated by the Obama administration that came from the EPA that restricted what coal industry participants could and couldn't do. And the reason they found that violated the major questions doctrine, this is really important, is that that would on net result in about $2,000 of added expense per American family. And that was a sufficiently major impact on the economy that it violated the ability of the administrative state to actually do it. Well, that was an outstanding decision, well argued from the current court, which I give the prior Republican president, President Trump, immense credit for giving us a court that came to the right place on this question. But now we have to take that to the next level. If those regulations in the Clean Power Plan were unconstitutional, then that quite literally means that most federal regulations, I don't use that colloquially, I mean that literally, a majority, quite likely an overwhelming majority, of current federal regulations are unconstitutional under current law in the United States of America. And on day one, January 20th, 2025, it is the job and duty of the next president of the United States under West Virginia versus EPA to immediately rescind the effectiveness of a majority of those federal regulations. And I will give you a sense of how broadly that view actually spans from independent contractor regulations that Obama had, Trump rolled back, Biden brought back. We have gig economy workers numbering in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, over a million across the country covered by these regulations that were passed in violation of the major questions doctrine based on the West Virginia versus EPA standard. E-cigarette regulations from the FDA that are driving more of them into the black market like many regulations at the FDA, which do not match any statutory authority that Congress ever gave to the FDA, are unconstitutional under the major questions doctrine. 
car modeling standards for large cars versus small cars, emissions standards, emissions reporting requirements by the SEC, heck, even accredited investor standards by the SEC saying who can and cannot invest in certain kinds of companies. All of these fail the major questions doctrine test based on the impact they have on a family. If $2,000 per family is itself unconstitutional in the scope of impact, literally an overwhelming majority of these federal regulations will on their way to being rescinded during the first days of an administration that actually understands what's going on when it comes to the unconstitutional administrative state. So that's the first element is undo the damage that's already been done by rescinding the federal regulations that are already on the books. But now let's come to actually how we not only rescind the regulations that Congress never authorized, how about actually rescinding the existence of bureaucratic agencies that Congress never authorized? And I'm going to start with an agency that to many people's surprise was not, despite getting appropriations yearly, was not actually authorized by Congress. Let's talk about the FBI. This is an agency, if I'm gonna make a book recommendation everybody, I like to write books, but I also like to read them from time to time. G-Man, such a great book, it's not, a, not some Republican guy, I think he's like a Yale historian, came out in the last couple of years, Pulitzer Prize winner, laying out the history of J. Edgar Hoover's legacy in the FBI, how this was an institution that was created to be corrupt from the beginning, the same one that used illegally collected tapes to thre threaten Martin Luther King Jr. into committing suicide, they tried to do, is now being used to target political opponents of a different persuasion. Where does the corruption come from? It comes from something you'd predict should exist for a bureaucracy that sits in between a DOJ, like the equivalent of local prosecutors at the local level, and say other police enforcement arms like the U.S. Marshals, which haven't been corrupted in the same way as the FBI. So this is what the situation looks like today. That's the status quo. And in more detailed plans, for ease here, we've used a short version. There will be more detailed versions right now up on Vivek2024.com laying out even more detailed reorganization plans. This is deeply pragmatic. Take the 35,000 employees at the FBI, 20,000 of them are in non-essential functions, back office roles, many of whom report into, of all building names, I'm not making it up, the J. Edgar Hoover building right here in Washington, D.C. They're going to go home when we shut it down and find honest work in the private sector. But 15,000 of those employees are going to be reorganized into the U.S. Marshals, into the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network at the U.S. Treasury, into other parts, the DEA that are taking on the drug enforcement, the drug enforcement problems that we have in this country. Because part of the problem when you have a bureaucracy that runs this deep is that they find things to do that they shouldn't have been doing in the first place. Post 9-11, what happened with the FBI is they took on counterterrorism from drug enforcement to child sex trafficking to financial crimes and white collar network enforcement. These are areas where people had no specialization in the first place and they're rotating so we're at once less effective in actually enforcing the laws on the books while also creating the formula for the corruption that we now suffer today. And this is where I think we face a choice. Do you want incremental reform, replace Christopher Wray with James Comey or James Comey 2.0, or recognize that it's actually the underlying machine that was the source of the corruption itself? And I believe the only correct answer to restore the integrity of our law enforcement apparatus will be to begin with shutting down an institution like the FBI itself. We'll move to the next institution. The U.S. Department of Education. This is an agency that spends approximately an $80 billion budget per year telling local schools that they can't get those federal funds unless they adopt toxic racial and gender ideologies while denying, and this part's less well known, denying federal funding. That's about 10 to 11 percent of a school's budget to schools across this country that dare to teach kids how to engage in hunting or teach them how to practice archery. Those have been the bases for denying funding to schools while telling other schools they can't get 
actual federal funding unless they adopt toxic device of racial and gender ideologies and racial quota systems in their hiring. This is an institution that has driven the epidemic of inflation in college tuition costs while subsidizing four-year college degrees, not doing basically a thing for people who want to pursue one-year vocational programs. The root cause, the original sin, was the fact that the federal government should have never been involved in local education in the first place. So remember one of the bases for the U.S. president to shut down an agency, promoting the economy and efficiency. Taking that $80 billion and giving it back to the people meets that statutory test. And that's why we won't just put a good person, and I respect Betsy DeVos, and I respect people who have served in that role. We won't just put a good person on top. We will actually get in there and shut it down while moving certain of the remaining functions like loan collections to the U.S. Department of Treasury, that limited sliver of workforce training to the Department of Labor where it belongs, that's how you actually drive change. And so I'm going to go quickly through a sample of the remaining agencies that we will shut down in the same way. Take the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the three-letter agency that has stood in the way of advancing nuclear energy in this country in the name of promoting safety. We have no Gen 4 reactors in the U.S., the only country in the world that does is China. We have very few Gen 3 reactors. We have Gen 1 and Gen 2 reactors, which are 60 plus years old, which are less safe, even compared to Gen 3 and Gen 4 reactors. In the name of an agency, before its existence, you could build a nuclear power plant in five years in the United States. Now the average time is 25 to 40 years. Even as in Japan, it's closer to five. In France, it's five to eight. Falls at the feet of what Brooke talked about at the very beginning that administrative state. This was never passed through Congress, these regulations. It's fundamentally the culture of an agency that believes that there shouldn't be another nuclear power plant in the United States. And that's why since its inception, there has not been a single nuclear power plant built in the United States of America. What we say is, you can't reform an agency with that culture. You have to get in there and shut it down. Move a small number of the remaining employees to the DOE and to other parts of the government where they can use that expertise to promote actual innovation in nuclear energy in the United States. And so we'll conclude with this one. There's actually more poster boards back here in time permitting. We'll get, this is just the beginning of the list of federal agencies that we will either shut down or downsize by 75% or more, but take the ATF. And here I want to recognize Matt Gates, who is actually, I'm seeing in the front row here, for proposing, as I, as I recall <laughs> from earlier this year, a piece of legislation that would have, in, it was a January of this year, defunded the ATF and caused it to abolish its existence, which is a perfectly fine way to go about doing it. The problem with Congress is you've got 500 plus people that have competing interests that aren't actually able to properly oversee an administrative state that reports into the duly, duly elected chief executive of the country. Which is why, as the next U.S. president, if I'm elected, will shut down the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, one of the agencies that has been most toxic in even its misappropriation of funds. This is one where, and I quote the actual, the, this, is, this is directly from within the agency and the Office of Personnel Management itself. This is an agency so corrupt that this is their words, not mine. The ATF's upper management has demonstrated, and I quote, total disregard for federal human capital management law, regulations, policies, and practices. An agency that is now with their bump stock regulations and otherwise so far reaching beyond its constitutional scope, that can't be reformed. The correct answer is we will once again get in there, and you're starting to see a pattern here, shut it down. That is how you revive the integrity of a constitutional republic. And if you want to look at actually tracing and possession, move that to the U.S. Marshals. You want to move that to the Secret Service, agencies that have not yet been corrupted. And so this begins to give you at least a preview of what the new administration, starting in January 2025, can actually begin to do. I'm running to lead that movement for our country, but it's not going to happen, as I said, as a one-man show. Every one of us, from Congress to the Senate to every citizen in this country, 
has to play a role in reviving our country. And I want to recognize people in this room who worked hard starting in 2020 on the Schedule F exceptions that I think are a key part, a key step in beginning to reclassify federal employees to open up the possibility of firing. But what I'm suggesting now is the next president of the United States now needs to go further in having a deep first personal conviction that these laws are unconstitutional, that the regulations passed pursuant or not pursuant to those laws are also unconstitutional, and have the spine to actually ensure that we have one executive branch in the United States of America. And I think that is the choice we face at this juncture. Do we want incremental reform? Or do we want revolution? I stand on the side of a revival of those 1776 ideals, a revival of that idea that, yes, we the people create a government that is accountable to us, not the other way around. This is what unites us as Americans, and this is personal to me. I grew up into that generation where we were taught to celebrate our diversity and our differences so much that we forgot all of the ways we're really the same as Americans, bound by that common set of ideals. E pluribus unum means from many, one. That is the dream that won the American Revolution. That is the dream that reunited us after the Civil War. That is the dream that won us two world wars and the Cold War. That is the dream that still gives hope to the free world. And if we can revive that dream over group identity and domestic monarchy, then nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus, not a three-letter government agency is going to defeat us. That is what American exceptionalism is all about. And that is what we together will revive to save this great nation. Thank you all for coming today. May God bless you. God bless your families. And God bless our United States of America. Thank you. Brooke, I've made a mess here. Well, <laughs> we made a mess. As the mother of four children, I can appreciate we can get this all cleaned up. We got to clean it up. Uh, Y'all, as they are flipping the stage up here, we're going to bring a couple chairs up and we're going to get to have a fun conversation uh, with Vivek. But how about one more round of applause for the vision, the inspiration, uh, just incredible mind behind this. How about a round of applause for the stage switchers? Like that was, that was perhaps the most impressive thing. Uh, no, uh, sincerely, Vivek, thank you. And as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, the the path that you have chosen, wherever it ends next year, uh, or four years later, or eight, or where, whatever it is, it is very clear that I I personally am animated when I think about the founding of our country, and it wasn't thousands of people, it was a handful of committed patriots who refused to give up. And when you mention revolution in your comments, I think that's in a way very similar to where we are today. And that handful of committed patriots uh, can truly save a country and change the trajectory of, uh, of America. So God bless you for answering the call. It is uh, really fun to watch you uh, out in America on this journey that you have chosen. Uh, recently, I saw a video of you speaking to a senior in high school. And you told him that it's important not to think with the pack, to be willing to be a contrarian. Um, today, you're with us in your capacity as a successful businessman and entrepreneur. Uh, but the journey that you have endeavored, clearly, many would say, is a little against the pack uh, in, in the best way. So what advice and how has the advice you shared with this young man, how has it led to where you are today? 
Well, I think that this is a distinctly American view, by the way, Brooke. So for me, being willing to take risks and to fail is a core part of how you actually get to success. And I think that that's part of the founding spirit of this country as well, that in some ways we've lost. We talked about 1776 earlier. I think we live in a kind of 1776 moment, and I think what I, I, I think it must have been the same young man, I, if I'm remembering the conversation you saw correctly, where I told him, you know, you don't know how old Thomas Jefferson was when he wrote the Declaration of Independence? He was in his early 30s. I think he was 33 years old. And he not only wrote the Declaration of Independence, he invented the swivel chair while he was writing the Declaration of Independence because he felt like he needed it to think. He's like, well, I can't think unless I'm spinning around. Let me just invent the swivel chair. That's the swivel chair we sit in today. And by the way, Benjamin Franklin, who's one of the co-signers of that Declaration of Independence, invented the Franklin stove, an early remedy to the common cold, the bifocal spectacles. What do we say today? That's for the technocrats. Right? It relates to the speech I just gave, actually, that that belongs to the technocracy, that that's actually something you can't do. And if you dare to do it and fail, we're going to punish you for it. And so part of the journey that I've taken, Brooke, is one where, yes, I have taken calculated risks. I haven't succeeded every time, but I've succeeded more times than I've failed, which has allowed me to get to where I am. But I want to create a country where every kid has the space and sense of self-confidence to actually be able to do the same thing. And I think it's, it sounds like it's a different topic, but it's not really. It's deeply related to the discussion and the technical discussion we just had about shutting down the administrative state. I feel like there's an inner animal spirit in the heart of the American soul that has been domesticated, has been tamed by this new cancer that penalizes the pursuit of excellence and celebrates victimhood and limitation instead, restraint. And our culture, our animal, that has leapt oceans to lift up places like China, while their culture of Maoist victimhood and even stifling technocracy, that's leapt back to hold us back. And so I think when we... Many of us rallied behind the cry to make America great again. That's what I think we actually hungered for. The unapologetic pursuit of excellence in this country. That's what it means to be an American. And yes, part of excellence is if the pack goes that way, you go that way as long as you know that you're actually right. Be contrary and be right. That's my advice to every entrepreneur. That's my advice to this country, and I think that's a big part of how I'm going to lead if I'm elected as the next president as well. Yeah, well said. Well said. It's, I know for those of us in the audience, those watching with all the cameras in the back, uh, those of us sitting here that were in the last administration and in the last White House, um, it's interesting because when I uh, agreed to go in in year two and stayed for those final three years and planned to stay longer, uh, I had a lot of people tell me, oh, it's a lost cause, that the, the government of America, and it's just out of control. Like, you can make little, little changes around the margins, but there's no way to pull it back in. So when I left Texas, moved to Washington, joined the White House, and I think I speak on behalf of a lot of uh, those from our administration that are here, um, I didn't know what to expect. I knew we had a businessman in the Oval Office. I knew that he challenged his team to swing for the fences every day. I will tell you when I left, I was actually more encouraged than I had ever been in my life in 20 plus years in public policy that this country can be saved. But to do it, you have to think big. You have to have a very intentional and purposeful plan and you have to be willing to be contrarian and go against the pack. As you continue your journey and you lay this out, and over the next few days or weeks or months, you'll probably be told a lot that what you just outlaid here will not work. How do you plan to manage through that and to prepare? Whether you're in the next White House or whomever it is, I'm assuming you'll be a part of the next plan and what that looks like. How do you, Vivek Ramaswamy, and your team get ready to move forward on these big ideas that we're talking about? Sure. So I do think it takes a unique combination from the top. I think that that is part of what calls me into this journey. I do think it takes an outsider who has 
if I may say, complete and total disregard for the norms of Washington, D.C. And I'm guilty as charged on that. Uh, and I think that your, your former boss was guilty as charged on that, too. But I think it also is important for that outsider to have a personal, bone-deep understanding and conviction in the laws and the Constitution of this country, or else there's a risk that the members of the managerial class, and it's not that different, it happens in the private sector too, the way middle management might tell the CEO what he can't do, what the associate deans of God knows what, proliferating like a cancer in our universities, tell university presidents they can't do. You have that same managerial class. The swamp doesn't just exist in D.C. The swamp exists in parts of the private sector too. Deep corporate is the parallel counterpart to the deep state, and some people fill the same positions in alternating years in both. I think it requires leaders who are grounded at the top in conviction. If you're a CEO, what's the purpose of your company? If you're the CEO of the executive branch of the government, what is the purpose of leading in the federal government, and what ought you not be doing as well? And so what am I going to be gu guided by? There's no doubt that there's going to be uh, a range. You know, I see a lot of cameras in the room. Maybe it's already begun laying out all the reasons why the things that I laid out in that speech are infeasible or not grounded in the right legal authority or otherwise. The first thing is I, I like to be grounded in strong principle. The current Supreme Court, which as I said, I give Trump a lot of credit for. I think we win six to three on pretty much every con legally contested question that I laid out in that prior speech. Are there going to be some who disagree? Absolutely. But the current Supreme Court, the Supreme Court that gave us West Virginia versus EPA, I think backs me up six to three on every legal question on exactly how we will use executive authority to shut down the deep state. And so one is you got to know that you're playing the winning hand. That guides, you know, it's like a, any negotiation, right? You play the hand you have. I think we have the winning hand with the Supreme Court that we do now. And then you got to be thinking about guided by your purpose. This isn't that I have a vendetta against any of these individuals who are working in these agencies. To the contrary, these, many of these are good people, individual people living their lives privately in their own families. This is no personal animus against any of them. It is a machine that's actually the source of that problem. And so when you view it that way, you say you're guided by that purpose of why it is you're doing what you're doing rather than, you know, animus or vengeance, I think we actually go further with our own agenda. And so I think it's that combination of knowing at the Supreme Court we have that winning hand, but at the same time being guided by a purpose that's bigger than one man, bigger than me. I mean, I give Trump credit for giving us the Supreme Court that I've said that I would like to use by winning six to three, such that the next guy who comes after me or gal, whoever it is, doesn't have his or her hands tied in the same way that the next presidents will appear to be in January 2025. And so that's something I would encourage all of us to think about in our America First movement, and it is our movement, is that it's bigger than any one of us. We're each playing our role in driving this change, but we got to start thinking about how we're driving change on the timescales of history, not just two or four year election cycles. And the interplay between what the next president can do, backstopped by what the Supreme Court that the prior president gave us, this is how we drive that change on the timescale of history. And so like you in 2020, Brooke, that's why I am also deeply optimistic about our ability to actually see this through. It's just gonna take some people with spine willing to take that risk actually getting that job done. Well said. One thing I think is important to note, would love your, your thoughts on this. Uh, as conservatives, America first conservatives especially, um, I think we have awakened uh, a, a country and when you poll the policies that we believe in, whether it's securing the border or parents having the, the right to choose their children's school or you know, raising them in the, the way they see fit or, or peace through strength internationally or a, a healthcare system where the patient chooses, not the government or the, I mean, I could go on and on. When you take those ideas out into the country, 85% of Americans agree with us. And I think, you know, we talk about how divided we are as a country and we're just, we're on one side or the other. And, and I don't see that as much. And I'm curious your thoughts that when we lead on policy, 
we win because the American people are with us. Have you seen that in the last few months? Oh, I have. I mean, this is the, probably the top and most positive surprise of the last six months of this experience of traveling the country. We are not nearly as divided as we're taught to believe by media or social media or otherwise. One of the things that maybe against better advice uh, from a political perspective that I've done, but I just think it's, it's important if you're running to lead a nation and not a political party, is to show up in places like the south side of Chicago or Kensington in the middle of the inner city of Philadelphia. I've talked to people in West Maui. I haven't talked to Zelensky yet, but I did talk to people in West Maui. And, you know, one of the things that I see is common cause when it comes to the border. I probably haven't been in a room of people who were more vehemently in favor of my proposal to use the U.S. military to secure the southern border than a group of people in the south side of Chicago whose own school, high school in South Shore High School, is being converted into an encampment for migrants costing $7,000 per migrant per month when people in that community rightly ask a fair question, what about me in that context? Now, many of them disagree with me on, and I was challenged on this, I want to be transparent about that, on racial reparations. I'm, I'm against it. Most people, 99% of people who were in that room, it seemed like, or at least a lot of them, it seemed like, disagreed with me vehemently on that. But we agreed on the America First principles. And so my learning from that that I would share to the extent this is helpful for all of us in our movement is I think we have to walk the walk when it comes to thinking about America First principles in a way to go beyond traditional partisan boundaries. The way I'm looking at this is no state left behind, no city left behind, no American left behind. This is a multi-ethnic working class coalition of Americans who can put partisan boundaries behind them and just say our job is to put the interests of this country first. Advance our economy, shut down the administrative state, declare independence from communist China, keep us out of World War III, revive national pride. These are not Democrat ideas or Republican ideas if we have the courage to actually stop viewing them through those partisan filters. And, and by the way, just the speech like this one, here I'm given today, a week from today, or I think it's actually next Thursday. Yeah, we haven't announced it yet, but I'll, I'll say it here. Are going to give a similar speech as it relates to our foreign policy and taking and questioning certain assumptions. We're taught to believe that it is impossible, it will be economically devastating to the United States to actually declare industrial and economic independence from China. Well, that one we're not doing in Washington, D.C. We're going to do it in central Ohio. It happens to be my hometown, but it's also a place where we are actively onshoring a lot of production here to the United States in ways that don't have to be nearly as harmful as we're taught to believe. And so it's our job to, A, talk to everybody. We can't talk about free speech and then hide in our own echo chambers. But when we show up, what I found is that, boy, are you greeted, and I think your polls are saying the same thing, greeted with a lot more agreement. And then also talk about the how, because there's all kinds of myths. We talked about the myths relating to cutting, shutting down the administrative state. There are similar myths about what's going to happen to the U.S. economy if we actually dare to declare independence from China. And next week, just like we did today, we're going to debunk a lot of those myths. And I think America First will be the movement that reunites this country. Black, white, red, blue, it doesn't matter. We are all American, and the job of the U.S. government and the duly elected president is to put the interests of those Americans, all Americans, first again. And I think that that's something we can do to reunite this nation. And I'm optimistic about what I see. I could not agree with you more. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Why don't we, let's kind of close with your thoughts on, on my next statement, um, but it directs, relates directly to what you just outlined today with the bureaucracy. And that is in 2015, um, I and others have been working in the movement for a long time. Deregulation, the deconstruction of the administrative state, the bureaucracy, in, in the minds of sort of the, the leaders of the movement, that has been front of center. But in the minds of Americans, it was very low on the, on the, on the poll of issues that they cared about. This was, what, seven, six, seven, eight years ago. And I'll never forget when then candidate Donald Trump came down the escalator and started talking about draining the swamp. 
and caught the imagination of a nation. And I remember being so encouraged that there is a way to break through to the American people, that this idea from the political class, the political consultants, that, oh, you can only talk in 30-second sound bites, and, oh, you can't go deep on some of these policy issues, you're going to lose, you know, the, the, the vote or whatever, I think that um, was proven wrong the last time around because now draining the swamp and deconstructing is a top issue for Americans. But you particularly have a talent to take complex issues and really go deep and explain them to the American people. Have you found that um, the, the American in middle of Ohio, that they are open and willing and interested in understanding truly what's at stake and truly how to fix it? So I'll be very candid about this. This is, I'm embarrassed to say this was a surprise to me, but it was a surprise to me if I'm being very honest. Right, so I've been educated at top institutions, name brand, colleges, university, law school, all that. Okay, and I, I'm in touch with many of my former peers. I have not received questions as intelligent about central bank digital currencies or about the relationship between the U.S. dollar and the likely new currency being formed by BRICS nations pegged to the gold standard at a level of detail. My former colleagues at hedge funds in New York from Harvard College to Yale Law School, for, as I've gotten from people who are farmers in Iowa or people who live within a 50-mile radius of where I live in central Ohio today, that is deeply encouraging. Right? That is the founding spirit I was talking about. You know, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, I mean, these guys weren't traditionally college-educated founding fathers either. And I think that that level of curiosity right now is at least in my lifetime, as I've seen in this country, at an all-time high. That's a good thing. Why is that? I think it's because the last eight years, the people have been taught that the media is completely not to be trusted. The information you're fed, we know we've been burned from, and I'll be bipartisan about this, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, to the basis for the 2008 bailouts, to the Russia collusion hoax that never was, to the origin of COVID, to the Hunter Biden laptop story that was suppressed on the eve of an election to now how our money's being spent in Ukraine. We can go time and again. People now say, okay, fool me once or twice or thrice or seven times, shame on me, but fool me eight times, you won't, right? And so I think that that's created a hunger where what people in, what, they, what people, I hate the term middle America, but what are, we refer to as middle America are independently consuming information that is grounded in fact, reason, logic, skepticism of what they're fed. And boy, is that an opportunity for us right now. I mean, it's like a 1776 moment that we live in. And this is where I see the daylight between what I think of as an old GOP and the America First movement. It's a methodology question, right? Because the tradition, I get this advice too. The number one piece of advice that I get still from people giving me political advice, political consultants, good people, thoughtful, is simplify it. You got to dumb it down, make it simple, or else you're not going to win this election. The way I view it is there's a betrayal involved in that because the threats we face are complex right now. And so it would be a form of a lie to oversimplify that. And so I'd rather lose an election and speak the truth than to somehow win by feeding people poll-tested slogans. But Thomas Sowell, I think, had an inspiring quote from, I can't remember when it was. It was, it was a long time ago. But what he said was, if you care about someone, you tell them the truth. If you care about yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. And I think that this is why the GOP didn't succeed in 2022, actually, because the thing that polled well is Biden's agenda is doing poorly, criticize Biden, say Biden three to five times, as many times you can in a 30-second soundbite, and that's how you win, because that's what the polls tell you. But I think what people are hungry, craving, is an affirmative alternative vision, actually, a vision of our own. I, I, until I mentioned it there in reference to political consultants, I haven't mentioned Biden one time in the, in the hour and a half we've spent together now. And I think we need to get in the habit of that because, first of all, pursuant to the discussion we just had, we know that he's not really the person running the federal government anyway. right? It's, it's, a, it's a puppet, so you're missing the point if you obsess over one person. But more importantly, I think 
part of the America First movement. I think this is where it's a powerful movement beyond just a political partisan tug of war between the GOP and the Democrats is actually having a vision of, first of all, to put America first, we have to define what America is. And then once we define what America is, we have our vision that we actually put first above everything else. And I think that's going to be a formula for not just winning elections in landslides, though I think we can do that in 2024, but for reuniting a country that actually is beneath the surface far more united than we'll give it credit for. And the thing I'll, I'll sort of say in closing, from, from my part at least, Brooke, is if people say, um, you know, one of the criticisms I, I still get, I guess, is you're too young to, to be doing this. I was 37 when we started, but then I addressed that. I turned 38, you know, last month. So I believe in addressing critics. But, uh, but go back to Thomas Jefferson. He was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. But now let's just think about our country. The only thing I will say in our movement, okay, where I want to see us, and we're speaking amongst friends here to sort of level this up, is to say that I don't want our America First movement to be one that accepts that we have to be a nation in decline. Mm -hmm. We're taught to believe it. It's easy to believe it. I understand why you might believe it. We don't have to be a nation in decline. I think as a nation, we're all really just a little young, actually going through our own version of collective adolescence, figuring out who we're really going to be when we grow up. And when you view it that way, at least for me, it starts to make sense again. Right? You go through your adolescence, you lose your way a little bit. You lose your self-confidence. You lose your sense of who you really are. But we are stronger for it when we get to our adulthood on the other side. Yes, we go through that identity crisis, that national identity crisis. But we can be stronger for it once we get through it. And so, no, is my answer. We don't have to be ancient Rome. We don't have to be that nation in decline. I think we can still yet be a nation in our ascent. Maybe the early stages of our ascent, actually. Maybe we're not even yet at base camp. On our way to that country, to that mountaintop, to that nation where we can still tell our kids, you've got them, I've got them. <laughs> we want to tell them in good conscience that the United States of America is still that country where no matter who you are or where your parents came from or what your skin color is or how long your last name is in some of our cases, <laughs> that you still get ahead in this country with your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication, and that you know what? You're free to speak your mind at every step of the way and that the people who you elect to run the government are the ones who actually run the government. That's the American dream. That's what I think we got to start. Stop running from something. That is what we are running to. And that is what, due to the hard work of many people in this room, I am confident we will revive to save this great nation. Thank you Amen. all for having me, and I appreciate it. Thank Amen. You. Uh, Vivek, you are uh, an inspiration. I'm just going to close us, if you don't mind, with uh, something from Scripture. Proverbs 11:14. People lose their way without wise leadership, but a nation succeeds and stands in victory when it has many good counselors to guide it. God bless you for being one of those counselors, and God bless you for being in the arena. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you.